Ammonites make great fossils and they're great for rock shelves. But why are they extinct? Why aren't they still around today like nautiloids are? I got a comment asking this question an embarrassingly long time ago, and I'm finally getting to answering it with this video. So I hope you enjoy learning in this video why ammonoids went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous along with non-avian dinosaurs, while nautiloids, which were very similar organisms in many ways, survived and actually still exist today. Extinction events wipe out some species, but leave behind others. And understanding this selectivity of extinction events is very important for predicting the impacts of future events and environmental changes. The Cretaceous Paleogene or KPG mass extinction event, which occurred around 66 million years ago, was likely triggered by an asteroid impact and volcanism. It devastated both marine and terrestrial ecosystems, and it's famous for wiping out the non-avian dinosaurs. And I talk more about it in my KPG Extinction Event video. If you want to check it out, I'll link it at the top right. But a curious result of this extinction event was the extinction of ammonoids and survival of nautiloids, which were very similar organisms. Both ammonoids and nautiloids were slash are cephalopods, and um, cephalopods or cephalopoda is a major class of mollusca, the phylum of mollusks, which also includes major classes like gastropoda and bivalvia. So bivalves are like clams, gastropods are like snails, cephalopods includes things like nautiloids, squids, octopuses, and the like. However, there aren't just these three classes of mollusks. There's like nine different classes of mollusks, uh, but these are the three major classes, especially the three major ones that have a lot of species that have shells that get preserved. So in classes like paleontology, you'll hear mostly about these three classes. Cephalopods, which we'll focus on today because that is what ammonoids and nautiloids are, can be divided into three subgroups, including colloids like squids, octopuses, and cuttlefishes, nautiloids, and ammonoids. Also, I want to mention here that ammonoids is typically the term we use when talking about the ancient live animal of the ammonite. And ammonite is typically the term we used when talking about the fossilized shell of an ammonoid animal. At least that's what I gleaned from reading about them. Both ammonoids and nautiloids have chambers that grow out from the center, the largest chamber being the outermost one called the body chamber. That is where the living body of the organism goes. So when they're tiny and young, they have just like one body chamber and then they continue to grow out larger and larger chambers and spiral outward and larger. But one major difference between ammonoids and nautiloids is their position of the siphuncle or siphuncle. The siphuncle is a calcareous tube in both of these types of cephalopods that pumps fluid through the chambers to adjust their buoyancy. This helped them to adjust their buoyancy to go up and down in the water column depending on where food sources were or where they liked to live. And for ammonites, this is kind of in the outer shell position while in nautiloids, it's in the center. They also have different shapes of their septa. The septa are walls dividing the chambers. Ammonites had more complex squiggly septa, and nautiloids had straight septa. And possibly the most distinctive difference between the two, especially when looking at fossilized ammonites, is the complexity of their sutures. Suture patterns were patterns formed by the intersection of the septa and the shell wall. In ammonites, these suture patterns could get really complex and squiggly and almost uh, look plant-like or dendritic uh, in nature. And so ammonites are really distinctive in the fossil record because of their complex sutures. While in nautiloids, their sutures are just straight or kind of slightly curved, but not squiggly. They also had different shell wall thickness, uh, ammonites having a much thinner shell wall and nautiloids with a thicker shell wall. Oh, and something I forgot to mention with respect to their septa, the nautiloids typically had septa concave toward their body cavity or their body chamber. And the opposite was true of ammonites. They have septa convex toward their body chamber. But not all the differences between ammonoids and nautiloids were morphological. There were also ecological differences where they liked to live. Ammonoids, for example, inhabited shallow coastal waters based on where they were found in the fossil record, and nautiloids preferred deeper waters. 
They also slightly differed in terms of timeline when they evolved and how long they lived, obviously, since we're talking about why one went extinct before the other. In terms of their first appearance in the fossil record, nautiloids originated in the late Cambrian around 500 million years ago and are currently represented on modern Earth by the genera Nautilus and Allonautilus. Well, ammonoids first appeared around 450 million years ago, about 50 million years after nautiloids first appeared, and both survived the PT or Promo Triassic extinction, nicknamed the Great Dying, which occurred around 250 million years ago. Ammonoids went extinct, like we talked about, during the KPG, or Cretaceous Paleogene event, around 66 million years ago, while nautiloids obviously lived and are still around today. So therefore, they coexisted between 450 to 66 million years ago. Some would argue, however, that ammonoids were actually more successful because they were more diverse, especially throughout the Mesozoic era, after the Permo-Triassic extinction, before the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. They were likely more diverse because they had faster growth, metabolism, and reproduction rates, which allowed for faster speciation or faster diversification and made them less susceptible to predation by the recently evolved fish. Fish had just recently evolved by the time they, you know, started to diversify. However, their faster metabolisms might have actually contributed to their extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. They would have had a higher food demand during a period of plankton or food shortage due to surface ocean acidification during the KPG event. Another factor that contributed to the ammonoid extinction is their ecological specialization. Although ammonoids were highly diverse and occupied various ecological niches, they were much more specialized than nautiloids, in part because they had so many diverse species within their larger group of ammonoids. They could be more specialized because they had so much diversity, and this actually made their individual species more susceptible to environmental changes in temperature, salinity, and ocean chemistry, all of which changed during any climate or extinction event. They also were shown to have declined leading up to the KPG event, shown by a decrease in geographic distribution. This was likely due to cooling in the late Cretaceous just before the impact that led to the major extinction event. This cooling was likely caused by changes in ocean currents, which disrupted the distribution of their planktonic food sources. And again, they had a higher food demand already than nautiloids because of their faster metabolisms. Also, like I mentioned earlier, ammonoids lived in shallower waters closer to the coast than nautiloids. And during the KPG boundary, this would have made them more vulnerable to the surface proximate changes like the initial shock wave and tidal waves and climate changes caused by the impact. Ammonoids also produce large masses of floating eggs in the upper ocean, and while nautiloids produced larger individual eggs in protective capsules in deeper water, and thus they were more protected due to their capsules, due to their deeper water, due to the fact that they were larger, and thus ammonoid eggs would have been more vulnerable to the rapid acidification of surface waters caused by the KPG impact. So overall, nautiloids living in deeper waters helped them to better withstand the effects of the impact, or at least to better be protected by it, give them some buffer there. They also tolerated a broader range of environmental conditions. They weren't so specialized, giving them a better chance to survive the changing conditions like temperature, water chemistry, etc., and they also had lower metabolic rate, which was an advantage during the food shortage at the KPG boundary. And nautiloid hatchlings were also bigger and would have been less limited with respect to the size of their prey and thus their food sources. However, this whole video is about why did ammonoids go extinct at the KPG event while well, nautiloids survived. And now I'm going to throw you a huge curveball. <laughs> and that is that ammonoids may have survived into the Paleocene. This is the epoch just following the Cretaceous, so after the Cretaceous-Paleogene event. 
However, evidence for pileocene amnoids is rare and controversial, so this isn't confirmed, but it's possible. And even still, it's likely that these guys went extinct within 500,000 years of the KPG event, which correlates to around 65.5 million years ago, which is basically 66 million years ago. So they still basically went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous 66 million years ago. It's possible that some lagged on for a tiny bit, but it on geologic timescales is kind of hardly anything, you know, 500,000 years. So overall, those are all the reasons that ammonoids went extinct along with many of the dinosaurs while nautiloids survived and diversified in the Cenozoic and are still kicking today. I do want to emphasize that this does not mean that nautiloids were the more advanced or better group of cephalopods over ammonoids. Ammonoids were actually extremely successful, especially in the Mesozoic, and many people consider the Mesozoic to be like this huge like age of mollusks, especially ammonoids. And so it's not like extinction events wipe out the less successful groups. It's just a matter of what kind of extinction event is it? Is it warming? Is it cooling? Is it ocean anoxia? Is it ocean acidification? All of these things play a huge role in determining what kind of organisms are going to be more affected. Sometimes it's deep water ocean anoxia, sometimes it's surface water ter temperature changes and acidification, and so sometimes it's shallow organisms that get the brunt of it, and sometimes it's deep water organisms. And so things could have been really different. It wasn't that ammonoids were less successful. That's the point of that rant. With that, guys, I hope you will check out my uh, KPG extinction event video if you want to check that out, or other Earth history videos in my Earth history playlist. And as always, my references are linked down below in the description box, and I can't wait to see you guys in the next video. Bye!